thank you for inviting me, Rai. I think this is the second or third time I'm speaking at your at your convention. So happy to be here. Um, so we are going through every industry, and I think uh, retail, media, entertainment, travel, tourism are going through fairly difficult times. And I think what we need is a dose of steroids to get us bouncing back again. But I'm not here to give you any steroid injections, but uh, I did a little bit of homework and this is what Harvard Business Review uh, says that, uh, you know, how do you lead when your team is exhausted and you are also exhausted? Uh, so what are we to do? Because we feel a mental fog, we feel kind of a pandemic fatigue. We have an extended kind of a vacuum. We feel emotionally amputated. So this is not just India, this is all over the world. This is what a global survey has revealed. So what Harvard Business Review says is the leaders need to examine their personal resilience and that of their team members and the ability and the strength to overcome obstacles, bounce back and recover in the face of challenge. And they say there are three questions you need to ask yourself. How strong are you under pressure? How quickly can you bounce back from depression? And how can you find the mental strength to go through the last mile? In short, what the editors of Harbis Review are saying is that how can you become a super spring? Now, what is a spring? And those of you mechanical engineers here will recognize this definition. Spring is, is really a, a twisted piece of metal that can be pushed and pulled, twisted and turned, but it always bounces back to its original shape. Now, this is the title I gave to my book uh, called Spring, Bouncing Back from Rejection. I uh, wrote this actually before uh, COVID hit. In fact, the book had been completed in January last year uh, and it would have been released in June, but because of COVID, it got delayed, got released sometime in October. Question you may ask is, you know, uh, how am I qualified to write a book on this topic of, of rejection? So one, I have 40 years of experience, as Mr. D'Souza explained, out of that large part has been in advertising. And those of you who know about the world of advertising also know that advertising, getting rejected in advertising is regular. You get rejected internally, you get rejected by your client and you get rejected by your final end consumer. So rejection is part of a course. And in the last five years, I've been mentoring, coaching, uh, corporate leaders and startup entrepreneurs. And I've seen them face rejection. All this put together, I the idea of writing a book on rejection came, but the trigger was really a talk I gave in, a, in Bhopal at Jagran Lake University where a girl wanted to ask a question and finally the mic reached her and I delivered a talk on leadership lessons. And so she almost asked me in, in accusatory terms that, you know, uh, we are all young people here. We're trying to go out to do our career. We are scared of being rejected. So what do you know about rejection? You seem to have had a great education and a great career. Uh, do you know anything about reje reje rejection? So I, I had to explain to her and I tell her my own rejection experiences and that somehow resonated with the audience and they gave me a standing ovation. So I thought maybe that's a topic which young people, especially millennials, you know, age of say 25, 35 are really struggling with, uh, which is how to face rejection, how to face challenges, how to face failure. So the book uh, is really may ask you a question, how agile is your internal spring? How can you bounce back from your rejection. And so the book contains close to 60 different stories from various people. And they've been grouped in a, in a particular way. I'll explain why. So after doing all the, you know, my own introspection, talking to a lot of people, including bureaucrats, sports people, authors, uh, business tycoons, professors, I concluded that, and also reading a lot of books and watching a lot of videos and, and listening to a lot of podcasts, I concluded that facing rejection is normal. In fact, uh, we probably face more rejection than success. And so facing rejection is normal. And what you need to do is to understand how to handle this rejection. 
and in the book i've explained a three step process i'll take you through that now which is one is face you have to go confidently but you have to be ready to face rejection second when you hit by a rejection figure out how to process that rejection and finally you have to learn from every rejection so what do i mean by face facing rejection is common it's going to happen so you cannot walk into a situation thinking you're going to be rejected you cannot for example apply for a job thinking you're going to be rejected no you got to apply confidently or you're going to apply for a loan you got to apply confidently you got to go with full confidence but at the back of your mind you have to remember that you could get rejected so you got to be ready to face the rejection when it hits you so i'll tell a little bit of story about my own rejection story you know this was in iit i was a final year student it was uh, i think 1977 i applied for a job with hindustan lever and uh, as uh, they say they i got clean bowled in the first ball uh, I, they were asking me a very i thought what a difficult question turned out to be actually a very simple question i didn't know the answer so i got thrown out uh, out of the 30 students i think they selected three but i was thrown out uh, and then later i discovered it was a very simple question a year later in uh, march 1978 i was in i am calcutta i was a good student i studied very hard uh, and again the sali were came and now for summer internship i was going to apply to the sali and this time i thought i was confident you know i will know all the answers um so 40 students applied and and went through first round second round third round and finally two students were shortlisted for the final round and i thought this is going to be a tough technical question it turned out to be a trick question which i fumbled and i didn't get the summer internship and that's the time i stopped and said look what do i want to do during summer do i want to do a standard uh, summer internship which is going from shop to shop doing a survey or do i want to do something else and that got me to apply to a to an opportunity with a young advertising agency called rediffusion i did my summer internship there and then what turned out was they also offered me a final placement job a year later and so do hindustan lever had shortlisted me for the final placement in 1979 i didn't appear for the interview because rediffusion made me a, a pre placement offer and my friend said look you're crazy you know joining a small agency etc but in the end it turned out well and i'll end the story at the end of my talk by giving you a a, a nice little twist so the point is you can get rejected you can get rejected repeatedly but remember when you get rejected repeatedly you have to think and say is there a new direction to look at and in this case i managed to find a new direction and that direction led me into advertising and that built help me build a career in advertising in whatever respect i have in industry is because of my reputation as an advertising person uh, so that is my story of rejection let me also say that that may not be applic- applied to everyone there are enough people who have tried five times and got into a company or six times got into a company so figure out uh, is the rejection a mild rejection is it a hard rejection and you have to develop a way of figuring out what the rejection is and i call it different shades of rejection uh, when 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 someone walks into the retail outlet if the way he or she says no you should be able to figure out whether it is a hard rejection or a soft rejection like and then and then see how to navigate your way through so that's a little bit of rejection story linked to retail but now let me come to a different thing any idea who this person is uh, in the audience anyone knows the answer can they can they post it in the chat box is it is a chat is chat open to everyone meenakshi or no okay So, is there anyone in the audience who can guess who this is? It's not me. Okay. So, this is uh, India's leading Carnatic music singer called Sanjay Subramaniam. He's the number one Carnatic musician today. Now, he was performing in Bombay, and I had gone for this concert at uh, at Saint Andrew's Auditorium. and so there was a sarodis to perform it was a very small you know it was a very very thin audience and then 
Sanjay was going to perform. And then I discovered the uh, hall was virtually half or 75% empty. And I had to go to the organizers and I said, look, uh, you know, this is an insult. You know, you can't do this to number one Carnatic musician. So they said, no, no, no. We know that this turned out to be a disaster. But we've gone and told uh, Sanjay that, you know, the audience is low because the concert is being held in, in Bandra, which is more a rock and jazz kind of a place. And, and his response to the organizers is what was what blew my mind. He said, apparently he said that I don't, I've come to perform. Even if there are only five people in the auditorium, I will perform. Okay, that's what he did. It was an amazing concert. And, and that's where his total professionalism came into play. So what I will do is let me, you know, for his luck, there was a very, very, uh, very, very influential art critic who was in the audience that day. And the next week, she wrote this review in Mumbai Mirror. So let me read. While the concert did not get a full house, the famous writer, journalist, and art critic Shanta Gokhale was in the audience. And here is what she said in the Mumbai Mirror of 2nd November 2017. Attending on Sunday, I heard young Sarodis Abhishek Borkar play with deep involvement, but to a sadly sparse audience. The number increased for Sanjay Subramanyam, who followed, but only to some extent. It was shocking that this part of Mumbai, the concert was held in St. Andrews, could not muster enough people to even half fill the hall for one of the leading stars of Carnatic music. I do not exaggerate when I say that Subramanyam, recently awarded the prestigious title of Sangeeta Kalanidhi, was like one of those giant fireworks packed with gunpowder and tube of metal salts and oxides that burst into the sky and sent down showers of stars in a breathtaking display of light, color, and form. He sang for full three hours and he, she goes on. But the point is that the audience was thin, there were very few people, but there was one important person there who wrote a wonderful review for Sanjay's concert. So remember, you may walk into a meeting room you may be expecting to see the CEO or the CFO. They may not be there. They may be seeing young people sitting in the auditorium. But it may be that they will be more influential for your case. So forget the audience. Perform. Perform to your best. Okay. So that's 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 the first story uh, from a different sphere, which is music. Now let me present another facet here. Uh, Jeffrey Archer. Not a penny more, not a penny less. Uh, Harry Potter by, ja by J.K. Rowling. Chicken Soup for the Soul uh, by uh, Jack Cranfield. And of course, uh, Meluha by Amish. All of you know, many of you would have read these books. And these are big bestsellers. But do you know that all these authors were rejected by publishers, not once, twice, but something like 12 times, 13 times, 15 times, Jack Cranfield, 100 times, 100 different publishers. How did they keep going? How did people like J.K. Rowling, Stephen King, Amish keep going? So Stephen King narrates the story in his book called On Writing, where he was living in a trailer park, teaching English in a school and trying to get his book published. He used to send these manuscripts. They used to come back rejected. So one day he was sitting and writing for a few hours. And then he didn't like what he had written, taken the paper and put it in the basement basket, went out for a walk. When he came back, uh, his wife had read the, the story he had written. She said, Stephen, this is your story. This is your novel. Please sit down and write it. And so he sat down and wrote that story over the next one month or two months. And that became a book called Carrie. And Carrie, of course, some of you will know, uh, sold millions of copies, also became a huge book. So in the case of authors, they believe in what they were doing. And many of them succeed because they had enough conviction that that they can succeed. And there's someone behind them, helping them along as they went. Right. So that's a story from the world of literature. Now let me come to a story from the world of science. All of us know uh, Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam. Now, many of you may not know that APJ Abdul Kalam was the project leader 
on India's first attempt to send a satellite up called the Satellite Launch Vehicle Program, SLV program. SLV-1, which was sent up on 10th August 1979, came down to Earth in 317 seconds. It was a colossal failure. Dr. Kalam recounts the story in his book. And he said he had his inner critic telling him that this is, you know, you're a disaster. You can't do anything right. And that was a time Dr. Kalam says in his book, he had a mentor and a boss called Dr. Satish Dhawan. Professor Dhawan understood what had happened, understood the kind of crisis which Dr. Kalam was going through. So he doc told Dr. Kalam, now you go back to your house and relax. I will handle the media. So Professor Satish Dhawan went up to the media, had a press conference. He explained how the rocket had failed and they've learned their lessons and we will make it a success the next time around. Around a year later, 18 July, 1980, SLV-2 was launched. This time it was a success. And Professor Satish Dhawan did just the opposite this time. This time he told Dr. Kalam, you go and face the media. I am going home. And that's when Dr. Kalam got his inner confidence back. And that's the journey of Dr. Kalam from there to becoming the India's most beloved uh, president. Now, the lesson here is that si learn to silence in the critic. And in the case of Kalam, he had a wonderful mentor who helped him silence his inner critic and get over the rejection hurdle. So that is Dr. Kalam's story. So these stories we saw were all about facing rejection. What happens to you when you get hit by a rejection? The other important thing about facing rejection is that it is not about you. Don't take the rejection personally. Uh, you're not being rejected. Your CV has been rejected. Your proposal has been rejected. Your project has been rejected. You're not being rejected. So once you've taken it out of you, you put it in the middle and don't blame the other side either. That doesn't help anyone. There's no point in blaming the other side. Happen. So process the rejection, processing rejection, extremely, extremely important, right? So let me take you through a few stories about processing rejection. Now, all of you know Rahul Dravid is, is someone whom we really love and he's been an outstanding, outstanding cricketer, right? Outstanding cricketer. He's been a boon to the Indian cricket field. But I don't know how many of you know that he was dropped from the Indian one-day international team. And I think the chat uh, is live. You, some of you can even guess the year when he was dropped from the Indian uh, ODI team. It was the year 1998. And uh, what did he do when he got rejected? Did he sulk? Did he cry? Did he go to Delhi and complain? So uh, India's uh, Snooker champion, Geet Sethi, uh, writes this in his book. So he was preparing for his world championship and he was in Bangalore in the stadium getting his physicals done. And he saw Rahul Dravid in the stadium. And Rahul had been dropped on the Indian One Day International team. And the news had just come out the previous week. So he was surprised that Rahul was there. And he went up to Rahul and asked him, what are you doing here? So Rahul said, look, I need to get my upper body muscles built. So I've got a special trainer who's going to come and train me for my upper body muscles. And this is how you face rejection. You don't go and cry. You don't go and complain. You look at yourself, right? And and what happened a year later at the World Cup, uh, Rahul Dravid turned out to be the highest run getter, not only for India, for all the teams. So when you get rejected, when you get dropped from a team, don't curse. Just practice more and you will succeed. So that's first lesson from processing rejection. The other Lesson is from a company called Saral Design, uh, which I've been helping for some time. Saral Design is started by two young technocrats, uh, uh, Suhani Mohan, high quality, uh, low price sanitary napkins and, uh, and machines would make those sanitary napkins. Now they had got raised money from some friends and angel investors set up uh, their test facility, made the first two machines. 
and they started knocking on doors of VCs. They went through over a period of 50 weeks, they went through something like 100 presentations and they got no money, zero money. Fortunately, there were some angel investors who kept buying money back. So they kept the operation going, kept the employees going. Fortunately, they got shortlisted to a competition in uh, California where they went, they made a presentation and in the presentation, a lady met them and said, look, you're doing it all wrong. They said, she said, look, pack investment VCs. They had not heard of the term before, but they listened very carefully, rewrote the entire presentation and started reaching out to impact investment VCs. 100 presentations, zero checks. They made 10 presentation to impact in VCs and they managed to pick up four checks. So that's the power of finding a good mentor who can help you process the rejection. Uh, and that is a very, very powerful, powerful lesson. So when you get rejected, maybe you won't know why. So find a mentor who can help you and advise you. So let me now tell you a story from the world of advertising. Uh, the year 1997, India was opening up, new car companies were coming into the country. We were invited to pitch for the Hyundai account. Six agencies had been invited, so we uh, all prepared and we went to Chennai and made a presentation. And as we were walking out of the presentation, uh, somehow I felt that we had done a very bad job. Uh, my colleagues were not too sure, but then afterwards when he came back to Bombay, we sat and understood that we are not going to get this business. We realized that we did not know enough about the category. We did not know enough about car buying. We did not know enough about how the market was going to change. Got us thinking. We said, if we pitch this way, we will not win a car account. And so we spent the next three months trying to understand car marketing. And as luck would have it, in January, Tata had unveiled their new small car and we met the Tata Motors team, got them involved in a case study competition. And then they invited us to pitch for the business and we pitched and 15 agencies pitched this time and we came out on top. We won the Tata Motors business. And then of course we handled Indica, Indigo, whole variety of brands. The interesting story is the agency which won the Hyundai business managed to handle that business for about eight years. Whereas we who won the Tata Motors business handled that business for more than 15 years and continues to be in my old agency, right? So sometimes rejection happens for good. That when you get rejected, you can figure out what you did wrong, what you did right. And if you learn, you can do it better. So remember, when you get rejected, play back what went wrong. So let me take a moment and play an ad. So you're standing there About a fella much And when you moved your mouth to speak I felt the blood go to my feet Nice car Baby I love you to want me The way that I want you The way that it should be Hello, it's me. Can you give me a lift? Tata Indica, more dream spoker. That was just a commercial break, just to, uh, this is an ad we made for Tata Motors. Uh, I think it's um, an ad which actually went down very well. So, so remember, when you get rejected, learn to process the rejection well. So facing rejection part one, processing rejection part two, now learning from rejection. So now how do you learn from every rejection? So if you, I think Einstein said, insanity is when you expect different results by doing the same experiment. So if you do the same thing again and again, 
If you got rejected the first time, you'll get rejected the second time, third time, fourth time. But if you learn from every rejection, you will become that much better. And like in the case of Hyundai and Tata Motors, a rejection may actually lead you to a better place. So let me tell you this thing about academics. And I spent time talking to academics on how they handle rejection. As you know, in PhD, uh, when you're trying to get a PhD, uh, or if you're an academic, uh, you have to submit your papers to journals. What the journals do or the conferences do, they mask your name and they send it to three or four people to do peer review. They're all people at your level. They have to review the paper and that the journal will ask them, do you want to accept, do you accept uh, the, the paper or do you reject it? So they have to write accepted, why it is accepted or rejected, why it is rejected. Now, some academics go through mortal fear that, oh, my paper will be rejected. Oh, my paper will be rejected. But what is true is if you're a very, if you want to be a successful academic, you got to understand rejection may actually not be so bad, right? Acceptance is great, but rejection actually may be not too bad for you. So there is someone who I spoke to is in computer science in America who has published 20 good articles in the leading conferences. Or well, he said, he did an interesting analysis. He said out of the 20 articles, you know, 13 of them were accepted first pass. Seven got rejected, not once, maybe even twice or thrice. But he said the papers which won awards were all papers which got rejected. And the truth is that when someone rejects your paper, he has to write what is the reason. And very often in the academic world, they tell you that this is what you think you've not done well. This is what you should do. or This is what you could have done. And smart academics figure out that's a way to improve my research. And when they improve their research, they actually become better. So every rejection makes them become a little better. And that's the lesson from the world of academics. And in the world of academics, uh, a lady, a professor wrote this wonderful article on creating her own rejection resume that, you know, this is the, these are the places where I've applied and I've been rejected. And that became viral in the academic world to the extent today, I think it's, it's a great exercise for you to say that, look, I want to write my rejection resume. Where all have I applied? What all have I tried where I failed? And what lesson have I learned from that failure? Uh, and when I used to interview people applying to me in my old job in advertising, I used to ask, okay, tell us about three things you succeeded and people reel out three things. I did this. And then the next question is, tell me about three things which you failed in. And what lesson did you learn? This is a vital question. And I, I think uh, if you, any of you in HR or interviewing people, I think this question actually brings out more than the success question. What, tell me about your three failures and what lesson have you learned? I think it's, it's a lethal question. It's a great question. It reveals a lot of character, resilience, everything, right? So uh, the other important thing is if you've not been rejected, you've not really tried to fly high enough. Who gets rejected? Only people who are trying to go beyond their scope, trying to fly higher, right? So remember, rejection is an indication that you're pushing the boundaries, right? You're getting beyond your comfort zone. Uh, and therefore, you probably will fly higher one day. So let me now, you know, I started with, with my own story. Let me end with another story of mine. Um, I had joined Ulka and I moved from uh, Chennai to Mumbai in 1994. At that time, I was given an advertising account to handle. It was a brand uh, from Wipro, which is a company which Ulka had got in 1989. And they'd done some very good work between 89, 1991, 92. And the brand had done well. And then the brand had kind of plateaued off. The sales had kind of stopped growing and started declining. And the uh, client was very unhappy. Uh, they were told, here's this guy coming in from Chennai and uh, he will he will get into the account and he'll do some fresh thinking. So when I got into the account, I realized uh, that there were two or three critical issues involved. One, the brand called Santur, the agency had cracked a formula 
called you know younger looking skin that santur is about making you look younger and uh, they had done this series of ads of mistaken identity where you know this lady is in a in a wedding and someone is saying iske sath raju ki shaadi kara de and a little kid comes and says mummy and they done a different version of it in another wedding and a third one with a bangle seller and then the sales it started coming down the agency felt that younger looking skin mistaken identity mummy was very potent potential it could continue for a long time and they had written another story set in a in an aerobics uh, class uh the client was not sure client felt that uh that this younger looking skin mistaken identity maybe doesn't have legs it may not work uh so the agency was told to think of new ideas the new ideas were not coming and i was put in the middle of this hot soup as i started understanding the situation uh i felt that maybe younger looking skin is a concept which can continue maybe uh, mistake and anti can continue and maybe even that that aerobics can continue but but i had to convince the client to accept it so i reframed the problem and i said you're you're okay with all this but you're upset with with the with the with the aerobics class let me give you a different story so i wrote a story about a music store where the lady goes and tries buying a flute and and the client said yeah this is nicer this is something my consumer will accept but your aerobics class they may not accept i said look trust me aerobics will also work so let us make both the ads let's make both the ads and let's see what works better the my luck or my persuasion the client made both the ads and as it turned out the aerobics ad actually worked very well even in very conservative markets like andhra and from that aerobics came more ideas and this entire santur woman campaign grew new wings and santur brand started taking off to the extent we used to make we must have made during my time i worked on the account for 20 years i must have made close to 40 ads for santur all of them were on this broadly on the theme of younger looking skin mistaken identity and interestingly when i started working on santur in 1994 santur sales was less than 1/5 that of lux if lux was 100 santur was 15 but interestingly in 2018 santur overtook lux so in a sense levers rejected me that got me into advertising and as fate would have it i ended up working on a brand which competed with one of the top brands of levers and managed to beat that brand in the process uh, i helped vipro become a strong consumer play marketing company and a lot of surplus went from here in creating the it service business so in a small way i contributed to the success of vipro as a corporation as well so if you get rejected figure out learn from that rejection and try and reframe the offering so let me play that ad which took 9 months of effort to sell ah it's so sweet hai pehle kabhi nahi dekha ise excuse me kaun se college mein ho college aur main mummy iski to jaise to umr ka pata hi nahi chalta chandan aur haldi ke gun samaye santur twacha kuch aur nikhare santur 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 so sometimes you know rejection is not all bad something good comes out of rejection levers rejected me i went to advertising ended up working on a brand which beat one of the biggest uh, biggest levers brands right so good something good comes out so so remember you have to develop your internal spring and you cannot keep worrying about rejection there are phenomenal opportunities waiting to happen you have to take risk you have to be ready to face rejection see the positive side of every rejection and build your rejection processing system and bring enthusiasm and energy into everything that you do and as they say resilience is what is going to differentiate you in the future 
ability to overcome obstacles, the ability to face a hit and come back stronger. Uh, so the book contains uh, many, many stories, uh, how to become a super spring. Remember, face, process, learn. It's a simple three-step formula for you to face any rejection. And coming back to the Harvard Business Review article I read, and there was an interesting uh, thing that explained about what Lego has been doing over the last one year uh, with their employees. One is they share success stories. They share success stories every week. So they pick one success story to share across the network every week. Two, they set up interesting competitions for their employees and keep them motivated. Third, they communicate, communicate, communicate with their team members. Fourth, they don't hold any Zoom meeting which is more than 90 minutes, right? Shorten Zoom meetings. So fifth, they cut tumbleweed project. Tumbleweed projects are projects which go on and on and on without any resolution. They've cut, cut all those tumbleweed projects. And they allow constructive conflict among their employees and they take honest feedback. So these are kind of seven lessons from Lego on how they managed to do and survive during the, the lockdown and the pandemic. And uh, Martin uh, Seligman says, life inflicts the same setbacks, tragedies on optimists as on pessimists, but the optimist weathers them better. And psychologists say there is what is called learned helplessness when we stop trying, but if we start facing our challenges, we can come out that much stronger. As Nelson Mandela says, do not judge me by my successes, judge me by how many times I fell back, fell down and got back up again. So with that, I'm at the end of my talk. So let me just say this book, Spring is available, got launched in October, 2020. It's available on a book, ebook, as well as Kindle. Uh, and as Audible, it's available as Audible and as Kindle and as an ebook, as a regular book. Uh, of course, during the lockdown, Harish Bhatt of Tata Motors, uh, Tata Group, wrote about six books marketers should read. And I was grateful that he included my book, Nawab News Noodles, in the list of six books to read. And uh, these, are my, these are my 10 books. Uh, you can follow me on, on LinkedIn, uh, Twitter, and on Facebook. So I am at the end of my time, and I think Vinachi is signaling that I should stop. So let me just thank Rai for inviting me. And uh, have a great, have a great, great show, and have a great learning experience. So thank you very much once again. And all the very best. Have a great year ahead.